A new year brings new leadership for the EU. France takes over the EU Council presidency, but as Manuel Macron aims to tackle the bloc's challenges, he also faces a national election campaign at home. Will his domestic objectives shape his European agenda? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the French presidency of the European Union. France has taken over the European Council's rotating presidency for the first time in 14 years. Taking the reins from Slovenia, French President Emmanuel Macron will be the man at the top for the next six months. His first meeting as council chief has been held in Paris, where he outlined fairly ambitious plans. He says France will use the opportunity to push topics ranging from post-COVID economic recovery to migration policy and European defense. France's turn comes amid health, energy and refugee crises, as well as rising tensions along the EU's eastern border with both Belarus and Ukraine facing destabilizing challenges. Speaking alongside European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, Macron laid out his key ambitions. Our resolve is to bring progress over the next few months on a number of issues so that we can collectively move forward to have a more decarbonized society and economy with a climate package. During this time, we will be moving several issues forward, the mechanism of the borders, also all the mechanisms that will accelerate decarbonization of our transport, improve the electricity system and lower carbon emissions in our homes. During this time, we will be pushing our digital agenda with two major directives, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. We're very committed to make progress on that to regulate the market and content and create a genuine European model. Also, this time is very important in terms of social convergence and social justice for a fairer, more equitable Europe between men and women, for decent wages and pay equality in boards of directors of companies, and also a border security agenda defining defense. Meanwhile, France has its own presidential election scheduled for April, which many expect to be a tough race between Macron and several far-right candidates, as well as Republican Valérie Precresse. Macron has long touted his pro-European views to appeal to voters. For his supporters, the timing of France's EU presidency couldn't have been better. They hope it provides Macron an opportunity to differentiate himself from his domestic opponents and win re-election. But his critics have said he should have delayed France's turn at the helm until after the elections to avoid any conflict of interest. It's a mistake. He's doing it for his own interests, not those of friends. It's been four and a half years that he's been in power and he's obtained nothing and done nothing in the European domain, apart from achieving a sort of submission to Germany in the name of Franco-German couple. Now, Macron and former German Chancellor Angela Merkel were often described as Europe's power couple. But with Merkel now retired and Social Democrat Olaf Scholz, now in charge, it remains to be seen if their relationship will match the strength of Merkel and Macron's. Now, after taking office in December, Schultz made Paris his first trip overseas. Macron hailed their, quote, convergence of views. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock described Germany and France as the closest of friends at the heart of Europe, who have an obligation to strengthen the EU and make it an even greater world power. Paris as a first visit is more than a good tradition, but also a personal choice, because Germany has no closer friend than France, not only because of the German and French relation and friendship, but also because Europe is the main focus of German foreign policy. And for that, a strong Europe needs strong German-French impulses. So how will this new council leadership carry the EU forward? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined from Paris by Yasser Luati, he's a human rights and civil liberties activist and co-author of the European Islamophobia Report. Noelle O'Connell joins us from Dublin. She's CEO of European Movement Ireland and a board director of Ireland's Alliance Francaise. And in Warsaw is Wojciech Szybilski, editor-in-chief at Visegrad Insight magazine. Thanks all so much for being with us. I mean, you could say Macron has his work cut out for him, but there really is a lot on his plate, I mean, even aside from the uh, French presidential campaign right now, 
Uh, let's talk EU goals first. And Wojciech, I'll start with you. What do you think his priorities should actually be based on what he can actually get done? The priorities uh, are already set by the French uh, presidency. That includes the narrative of, of global Europe, stronger, uh, rebuilt uh, economy. Uh, also, a lot of uh, emphasis is placed on, um, on the European integration, cohesion between the peoples, re-enacting uh, re uh, European solidarity by people-to-people -people contact. So that is the official narrative of, of, of the presidency. The events, uh, the, the dynamics of, of global affairs that is going to shape this presidency are, however, twofold. On one side, they are external. On the other hand, they are internal. On the external side, there is a crisis with Russia, Russia threatening to invade Ukraine and currently also involved in Kazakhstan, at the same time exerting um, a strong pressure on gas prices and contributing to energy insecurity across Europe. Uh, so that uh, ability of uh, Europe to be a global actor will be heavily tested in the coming months of the French presidency. And at the same time, internal pressures and internal disputes concerning right. the rule of law, recovery, this will be on the plate as well. Absolutely. That's why I asked about uh, what you think his priority should be, um, qualifying it as to what you think he can actually get done uh, in the six months, given all the, the internal and external pressures that you mentioned. But, Noel, let me turn to you. Um, I know you feel migration should be a major focus. But, as you know, politically, it's a, it's a hot potato. How do you think Macron should play that, and how will he actually play that? Because he's mostly only talked about really strengthening EU borders? Well, it's certainly true to say that migration remains one of the major challenges for the EU. There have, of course, been many deep divisions on this and really, I suppose, a stalemate in terms of trying to determine a way forward that meets with the agreement of all the EU member states. So it certainly is a challenge and the crisis has its roots going back to the migration crisis, I suppose, of 2015, 2016. And as you said, it certainly, it is a political issue. It is, of course, a political issue in France as it is in several member states. And I think that action and that progress and that prioritization of migration as part of the presidency priorities is to be welcomed. Um, and I think that is a, that is certainly a positive aspect of the French presidency. But looking beyond the crisis and emergency measures adopted by that the common European agenda on migration, I think under the French presidency, it is really important that the EU must ramp up and increase its efforts to develop a comprehensible, a sustainable, long-term approach onto migration. Because we have to keep in mind the many challenges at the core of the migration crisis. We need to look at the common immigration, the asylum policy to protect those people in need. But equally, we need some form of legal migration to prevent mm. human trafficking, humanitarian disasters, the impact of climate change. So it's a very multifaceted issue. It's a very multifaceted challenge. Um, and the root causes of migration have to be looked at more broadly. So I right. think the French presidency focusing on this is, is timely and important, but is a huge challenge and, and one that will not be solved easily. Certainly. Yes, sir, I want to get your thoughts on that, uh, specifically on migration, but also on what you just make of the priorities that Macron laid out and how realistic uh, and sincere you think they are? Uh, well, it is difficult to speak of, to put a sincerity and Emmanuel Macron uh, in, on the same plate, uh, unfortunately. But uh, first, you know, what, what I think would be Emmanuel Macron's top priority, I think it should be to bring the European Union closer to its people. The EU is still a remote institution and very few people know how it works. But that would be difficult because Emmanuel Macron has refused to address the weight of the lobbies on the, uh, on the European legislative uh, uh, process. The second problem we have faced, uh, what we have been facing for the past couple of weeks, is the further politicization of the uh, migration crisis. And from what I just heard, it is not sufficient to throw uh, money and military expenditures on the European borders without addressing, as of course said before me, the root causes. And the root causes of these migrations are 
especially for France, its support to various uh, African uh, dictatorships. We saw how France supported uh, al-Sisi, supported the dictatorship in Chad, etc. And we refused to, to ask the question, why do these people leave? And what is our responsibility as the European project is ongoing toward these people? I mean, if we keep you know, plundering their resources and supporting dictatorships, we shouldn't you know, uh, be surprised when these people show at our borders and our shores. And the last point, if I may just add, that the, the uh, French presidency of the EU is already under intense uh, influence of the various lobbies. The Macron administration has not hidden its cooperation with various lobbies and industrial interests and has refused to play the card. How can the European Union act on the behalf of European citizens and not European financial and industrial institutions. Okay, very interesting. Well, uh, let me go back to Vojic, because you, you both seem to agree that integration and solidarity uh, within the EU should be a priority because it is challenging at this time. And you know, Macron sees himself as a very pro-European Union um, leader. Uh, but on the image of my, uh, sorry, on the, in the issue of migration, uh, Vojtec, you know, you had spoken earlier on this program, actually, about how Macron might manage the relationship with the kind of outliers of the EU, being Poland and Hungary, and their rather extreme anti-immigration views. Um, I'm wondering how you think he's going to take that further now that France does hold the presidency um, and manage migration policy from that perspective, as well as from the other areas where migrants are coming, in particularly to France. I would uh, underline the fact that we are talking about two issues when uh, packaging it as a migration issue. One is the border protection. And speaking of sovereignty, including sovereign Europe, you cannot miss the element of uh, border protection. The two countries that you, uh, that you mentioned, Poland and Hungary, indeed have um, the external borders of the EU, like also other countries, but these land borders have been breached uh, over the past year several times. And Macron seems to be, uh, by employing the language of sovereignty, uh, it, it, he is inclined indeed to embrace the perspective of Budapest or Warsaw on, um, uh, on, the, on the facts on the ground. The, the facts are that the borders are uh, leaking in a way they are not providing security in terms of control of uh, people's flow. The other aspect, migration and attitudes towards migrants, um, speaking uh, openly as uh, racism, um, that definitely shapes part of the societies um, in those countries, but uh, all across other countries. Racism is a serious issue uh, across uh, countries of the EU, including France, many others, N not to point fingers to one specific because it is a shared problem across the whole bloc. Mm -hmm. Migration policies here, um, depend very much on how much the, the states are capable of delivering basically social services to people who they are supposed to host. Right. And it seems that Hungary or Poland are totally inequipped and uh, also not doing enough to be equipped to host uh, an increased number of people arriving to the EU through their borders, through their external borders, including EU external borders. And the question is what France is doing and whether France um, integration policy or um, assistance to the migrants is, is enough. That is for me not to judge. It's an internal uh, element of, of uh, French uh, policy, but definitely is going to be a big topic okay. for the your presence as well. I can see all of you uh, very firmly agree with, uh, with that uh, analysis there, but I, I need to move on to some other issues. Wojciech, I'm going to stick with you for a minute uh, and quickly ask, I know it's not an easy topic, but uh, very important, you alluded to it in your first response, navigating Russia and Ukraine. France's foreign minister actually just complained a few hours ago that Putin, he thinks, is trying to bypass the EU by talking solely to the United States. What do you think? Should the EU try to change that now under, under Macron's leadership? Definitely there is an ambition in the French government, specifically with the French president who seeks re-election to demonstrate after failures of uh, so-called ACUS when France was sidelined in the deal on nuclear submarines uh, with Australia by US and UK to show that 
France has a firm control of the European uh, security. Uh, Macron is not anti-American by his policies or not anti-transatlantic. To the contrary, he is perhaps one of the most transatlanticist presidents of France so far. But yet he has to accommodate the sentiments of the public opinion during the campaign and also meet the, uh, the, st the stark reality that Europe doesn't have all the necessary tools unless it cooperates closely with the U.S. to contain the problem uh, that Russia is exploiting the, the problem of weak security of Europe without the United States. Right. It doesn't have all the facilities, including uh, not having an EU military that some have talked about. Um, let me ask uh, Noel if, if you think that could become an issue. People have talked about building this EU military, and now we have, you know, to look at really the relationship with the, the new leadership in Germany, Olaf Scholz being a, being a social democrat, um, how much do you think those two leaders could actually seriously look at the issue of the EU building common defenses? Well, it's a truism to say, isn't it really, that the, the Franco-German motor has, has really been to the fore in driving that European agenda and that European, uh, European integration process over the years. And of course, France being a founder member um, of, of the EU itself. And I think we are going to have to recognize as well just the very ambitious timescale and timeline we have. I think we've touched upon a huge range of topics that are obviously a priority and on the agenda for the French president. Presidency. But we also have to look at how the French presidential election timeline at the midway point of, uh, of France's EU presidency, how that is going to impact on the, on the workload and the agenda. How will that give time for the new uh, French leadership and uh, German leadership to bed in in terms of personal uh, relationships? But also, I think what we have seen is that the EU is certainly at a crossroads. France is not at the helm during its presidency on how we address these issues. And just like the migration crisis that we spoke about and many other topics, we can't afford to deal with any of these issues in isolation. They are multifaceted, they are complex, and the challenges on the borders are not going to dissipate and are not going to pause. And I think we need to see an ambitious uh, proposal and the strategic compass is certainly something that the conference that President Macron has spoken about in March on the security and defense agenda is certainly one we are going to be uh, watching and focusing on closely, but also looking as well at the conference on the future of Europe. Um, I'm the national citizen representative for Ireland, and that's the largest participatory democracy exercise that's taking place in the world. So that's a real opportunity for us all to shape and influence what type of EU we want. And with the French presidency coinciding with that, I think it's, uh, it's a really uh, important time for the EU to drive forward on mm. its agenda in 2022, because there's too okay. much going on that it can't afford to rest on its laurels. Right. Uh, Yasser, l let me pick up with you on uh, the election that was just alluded to. Um, first, tell us if you think there actually is a conflict of interest in Macron really having to campaign for re-election while running, you know, the six-month EU presidency, or at the very much, you know, at the very least, I should say, how much is it potentially going to distract him from the presidency's work? I mean, that's that's really a fundamental question. How, how come we don't have a mechanism in Europe that would actually uh, change, you know, the presidency or replace, you know, the, uh, the the country that will preside the European Union while the head of the state is running for re-election. You know, everybody and most you know, political commentators in France are already pointing to this conflict of interest. Can Emmanuel Macron run for re-election as he is the president of the EU? Uh, to quote a, a member of the Green Party, Emmanuel Macron will definitely use his his position in the EU right now as a stepping stone for his re-election. But if you may allow me to just, you know, backtrack a little bit for two words we keep hearing so far is in our integration and solidarity. I think, I don't think, you know, the European Union has built a reputation of being integrated and of having developed real solidarity. We have to keep in mind that so far European leaders have not undone what was done to Greece and how the sovereign debt crisis has been managed so far. No reforms or new, no new measures have been uh, passed. As, uh, 
for the integration. We still see that we are in a European Union headed by Germany, solely for German interests. And as for the question of a European army, I think we should need to stop you know, putting the question on the table because you know we don't even have a notion of common interests. For example, in the U.S., you have a federal state. You know, California would pay the debt of Tennessee or Georgia, to say the least. Not in Europe. When we saw it with the gas crisis with Russia, the Germans negotiated directly with the Russians. So where was the EU in this, you know, in this during that time to kind of have a common um, foreign policy and a common agenda with both the U.S. and Russia? So right now there are many contradictions that Emmanuel Macron will try to uh, brush aside in order to use this uh, these six months as again a stepping stone for his re-election. Okay. Uh, quickly on a, on a t more technical issue, though, if he does lose the election in April, I mean, does he ride out the term as EU president as just a lame duck? Uh, well, uh, I hope so. Uh, for Emmanuel Macron is trying to speak of again of integration in Europe and solidarity when we see the policies passed here in his own uh, country mine as a matter of fact we do not see integration and cohesion being a, a priority for Emmanuel Macron and we have to remind or tell our listeners abroad that just a few days ago Emmanuel Macron and forgive me the language spoke of quotation marks pissing off those who did not get vaccinated for the COVID. So how can we hope to have a person who's going to bring people together when he has uh, explicitly decided to divide and potentially conquer? Mm, interesting. Um, OK, I, I'd like to move on to one other issue, because, as you know, Macron seems to have very green long-term goals. Um, he mentioned that again in his speech today. He wants to see that 55 percent reduction in emissions by 2030. Uh, but the EU actually has had a problem with securing energy supplies for the immediate term. And it might be a huge problem in France. People are calling it a, an absolute energy crisis right now. Uh, Vojtjec, is it being taken seriously enough, do you think, in the context of Macron's leadership in France and now at the EU level? At the EU level, I do not think that we are taking it. Um, I mean, there, it is being taken seriously. Uh, politicians need to respond to their constituencies, and the anger uh, on gas prices uh, can be illustrated today in Kazakhstan. But a, a similar temperature of uh, political emotions uh, can be very quickly observed also across the EU. People will pay bills uh, or even have cut. Uh, uh, cut downs on electricity uh, because of, of what Russia is doing. Uh, so uh, there isn't anything that I would say is so far a proper EU response to that, um, partly because how Russia is driving a wedge between different countries. There is a, a potential opening of Nord Stream 2, to which the German Greens are opposing, uh, fortunately, for the unity of, of, of the Europe so far. But we'll see if that position holds within the whole of uh, the German government. And uh, in terms of, of France, um, well, I, I'm not an energy expert, uh, energy market expert, and specifically not on France. Um, but I I'm see I'm talking more about advantages. the political impact, yeah. But certainly there are some political um, uh, elements of, uh, of, the, of the campaign on one hand and also on the long-term uh, strategic goal of France, as France is uh, the country that can deliver on uh, alternative sources of energy that are, uh, that are nuclear energy um, and is going to uh, invest and show the potential to invest in that kind of sources of energy across Europe as a reliable uh, source. Um, Okay. during the green transition. Uh, let me ask Noel, I mean, for the EU uh, and for the long term, do you think this plan to cut carbon emissions is solid and eventually it will get the EU some, some credit as it should? The complexity of agreeing a common approach to the environmental crisis is certainly uh, been, been borne out at, at, a, at an EU level. But I think that there is no lack of ambition by the institutions and the Fit for 55, the Green Agenda, the, uh, the Carbon Net Neutral are all hugely important goals that we just can't afford, frankly, to, to, uh, to not be ambitious and, and act now. I think the challenge is 
for the citizens and for all of us and 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 for the EU more broadly is how to bring the people uh, along this this road and this journey and how do we change in terms of businesses in terms of countries and how do we also reconcile the, the many energy challenges that many member states have because uh, it's not uh, it's not equal and it's not uh, it, it, there are different challenges in different countries and how the EU navigates that very tricky uh, crossroads in making sure that we have a fair and equitable uh, energy policy is certainly something that uh, will not be easy to achieve, but I don't think we can afford to waste time because okay. the climate crisis is, is certainly, it's not dissipating. Absolutely. Okay. Noelle, I will have to give you the final word. So unfortunately, we're out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much uh, for being with us. And our viewers, of course, as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore Newsmakers. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.